Hey everybody, I'm here today in the Aspen Valley of Colorado and if you've ever wanted to know some tips from a professional garden designer and someone who deals with plants all the time for their uh, regular job, uh, that you're in for a treat today because I'm here in a garden that Tara Buff designed and also planted and maintains here in the Aspen Valley and um, it's really beautiful. I can't wait for you to see it. So, hey Tara. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for showing us your garden. It's this garden, it's amazing. Aww. So, um, tell me a little bit, let's just start by talking a little bit about what it's like to garden here. Um, it's amazing, um, you know, how can I not love it? Um, it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of seasonal changes and a lot of um, quick summers that we have a lot of different Different, a lot of uh, different exchange, uh, yeah. exchanges and temperatures and yeah, that's kind of, common for us to have 50 degree swings in the springtime and during one day. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. it'll be 80 degrees during the day and 40 degrees or even close to frost. Oh wow! Um, our frost safety date is June 10th, so I spend a lot of time using plants that can take a joke in the springtime <laughs> and maybe get a little bit of snow on them even in June and right that makes sense yeah and so the it seems like the the flowering season must be pretty compressed then if the frost dates are what in the June and on the front end and on the back and when's your first frost typically um we typically have frost start again in mid to late September right. but it's not unheard of to happen in August Wow. Um, yeah, I have uh, had to run around end of August and ghost, as I like to call it, all of the containers <laughs> by putting frost cloth over them um, right? and oh, wow. making sure that I pay attention to the weather cycles is definitely really important for me the early and late. Every yeah. day's weather report is a big deal. Yes. Yeah, that, makes, <laughs> that makes sense. Wow. Well, um, let's get started and just talk a little bit about... Um, Let's just walk through the garden and talk talk about the kind of the design philosophy and um, and the plants, the really Great. fun part. All right. So Tara, um, this garden is just packed with plants. It's blooming so much right now. Um, does it look like this in every season? No, it goes through quite a transformation actually. In the springtime, it's a lot of lupin and giant alliums. Mm -hmm. And then um, we go into having the dianthus along the border that really packs a punch of pink, which is our primary color for the garden. I see with all the <laughs> coneflowers and penstemons and cosmos. So yeah, pretty. yeah. And then um, the uh, then you get the nice uh, contrast with the leaves of the lamb's ear. That carries all the way through the season. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Yes, yes. And so... Um, in the springtime, we do the planting of the lobularias, um, lots of pansies we put in, mm -hmm. especially the ocean matrix mix um, seems to do really, really well and provide a nice blue contrast for the silvers and the pinks. Oh, pretty, yeah. So do pansies um, typically overwinter for you here or are they more annual? About 50-50. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's really nice to be able to have them keep naturalizing a section as we go along. We don't deadhead the pansies towards the end of the year, but kind of like the columbines that you saw, right. as long as we keep deadheading them, they'll keep blooming all oh. summer for us. Wow, I yeah. think a lot of gardeners in most parts of the country would really <laughs> love to have that be an issue. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to have that opportunity, that's great. So um, so this is this border wraps around the entire house and it's it's extensive, but I'm guessing you didn't start that way. No, um, the gardens actually started out as uh, wildflower sod, oh, and it was primarily just this front section here. Uh -huh. And so the original caretaker of these gardens installed a wildflower sod, which did pretty well, but um, like with a lot of things, if it's not maintained, the dominant species kind of took over. Mm -hmm. And it sort of started to defeat the purpose of having the variety and the right. heights and all that mm -hmm. stuff on it. Mm -hmm. So um, when I've been on this property for about 10 years now, and so our primary original concern was we were even more daisy heavy than we are now. Okay. Um, so we started just by thinning things out and the cone flowers were added. Um, this particular client loves pink in our gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just kind of been building off of that, trying to make sure that through all the seasons we've got the different 
heights and the different colors and something interesting seeing most of my clients are only here for about three months a year okay so really focuses on summer summer yes. bloom is the is the main goal here yeah and I just love this so I know you started with a wildflower meadow or wildflower lawn mm -hmm. is that what it was called uh, sod sod yeah. wildflower sod and um, but it still has this kind of really natural feel to it is um, talk to me about like how, how do you how do you achieve that um, well, this client, she really, I feel like, has kind of a French country feel mm -hmm. to her interior design. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I wanted to mimic coming outside, too, mm -hmm. as she looked out to make sure that the inside and the outside kind of okay. had some flow to it. Um, and she just really loves to have um, kind of the natural feel, uh -huh. not so formal. And l lots of drifts. Yes. And clumps. It just flows. Well, that's kind of the basis of my design theory is that everything should flow like water and um, just your eyes shouldn't be stopped. You should always be wondering what's going on around the corner of mm -hmm. something and wanting to walk further into it. That's a good segue. Let's keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sleeping bee right there. Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> That's so cool. That's He's awesome. just waiting for the sun to warm him up. <laughs> I guess so. Well, it should pretty soon here. It's warming up today. So um, these cone flowers go throughout the whole garden. And um, we talked about how you don't have to start an entire border all at once. Mm -hmm. if, you know, if, you, if your goal is ex you know, a really big extensive border, um, a good, you can totally start small and even on a budget be able to, to get there. So uh, how, how, like, there's a lot of plants that really lend themselves to that here. Yeah, it's great. Um, one of my favorite seasons is fall because you spend the entire summer learning about what's going on and what the garden wants mm -hmm. from you, basically. Mm -hmm. I try not to fight the garden. The garden <laughs> kind of tells me what's going on. And so with the cone flowers and even the salvias and the daisies, um, they're great because they multiply so much mm -hmm. that I find that it's a great opportunity to start small, let them grow, be happy, good soil, all that, and then you can divide them every year and keep expanding your garden. And, and then you get that same continuity and flow. Exactly. That yeah. really um, fits your design philosophy. That's a really good, good tip. So. Um, there are just so many really great looking plants here and things seem to be doing so well, but I'm guessing it's not always just so easy. What are some <laughs> of the challenges, you know, culturally that you face um, in this spot? In this spot especially, we have voles that like to <laughs> chew on things, mm -hmm. um, as well as in the springtime we get deer. Oh, yeah. um, so we do a lot of um, a granular coyote urine, okay. um, which does a fabulous job. And then we can also back it up with a deer spray mm -hmm. if we uh, have something that's giving us a little bit of a mm -hmm. extra problem, especially so on the delphiniums oh, and yeah. those real tasty treats yeah. for them. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> right. So, so what are some of the, how do you, how do you deal with the voles? Um, the voles, I found actually a packet that I put, because the voles especially really like the clematis, hmm, okay. um, the tender new growth on the clematis. So they, they chew the new growth. Mm -hmm. Do they do tunnel, do they tunnel and dig things out too? They don't really tunnel and dig, and I've actually started caging the base of the clematis. Okay. So this clematis is a perfect example of the damage that a vole or a mouse can do to a clematis. Um, Somewhere in there, it ate one of the stems, and you can see it's kind of dying as it goes up. And uh, unfortunately, I can't really get it out right now. <laughs> um, so we'll spend some time really being careful to cut out the dead parts. But it's not so easy as just finding it at the bottom <laughs> and pulling it from the bottom, is it? <laughs> no, unfortunately. It's all wound in there. <laughs> yeah. So that can be kind of frustrating when you have these fabulous clematis that climb up and across, and then all of a sudden you come in and it's like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's these packs that you can get that um, have a lot of essential oils in them, especially mint. Mm -hmm. It seems to repel them really, really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those have helped out quite a bit. 
and um, yeah. Interesting. Well, and that brings up a point. I know you garden organically. Mm -hmm. So all of these solutions that you're working on are all um, organic ones. Yes. Um, what about the soil? What's the soil like here? Um, we have a lot of red clay soil. Mm -hmm. So um, ideally with clients, I like to start off with, especially a new client, um, focus on the soil. Mm -hmm. It really makes all the difference. It's just That's what like you need food to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we spend a lot of time in the beginning of the season cultivating. We don't have the luxury of the high humidity that we have back east. You mm -hmm. know, I'm originally from Ohio, uh -huh. um, so you know about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great because you can put down the oh beautiful double shredded mulch mm -hmm. that y'all can get, mm -hmm. and um, it'll break down and mm -hmm. add to the soil. We're here. Stuff like that tends to just kind of sit and then you start to get fungus and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I use a more of a soil conditioner okay. as my mulch every year and okay. that way we can cultivate it in through the season. And it breaks down faster. It breaks down faster and it's mm -hmm. actually building the soil then. Do you add compost before you do that when you're starting a new bed? Um, typically add? not. No. Typically whatever soil, I rotate between two varieties and um, that way they both have nutrients in it, whether or not it's a turkey base or a bat base. Or, the soil conditioner. Mm -hmm, okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, interesting. so and that way too it helps because um, it leaches to the roots through the season. Right. And I don't have to spend a lot of time. I really don't fertilize the gardens at all. And so you add that every year and mm -hmm. that just continues to build the good soil over time and composts in place and mm -hmm. it, just, it just goes from there. Yes. How about watering? What's watering like here? Um, watering can be a little bit of a challenge. I'm really lucky that we have a great irrigation system here. Okay. Um, one of the main challenges I have on this garden in particular is that it is on a slope part mm -hmm. of it. Um, so when we set up the irrigation system, we had to make sure to take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that the sloped gardens were separated from the ones that are on more of a flat surface. Okay. So that those weren't being overwatered and that way I can kind of control this. Because the water could just run down the hill and exactly. cool and then overwater the mm -hmm. things at the bottom. So, so we do sense. a little bit more of a cycle soak <coughs> on the sloped areas, mm -hmm. shorter times, mm -hmm. more frequently. So that way to give it, it a chance to really soak Exactly. In. Exactly. That's, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right, let's keep looking. <laughs> The scabiosa is amazing. I don't know if I've ever seen such large flowers. Aren't they wonderful? They They're really one of are. my favorites, actually. Oh, so pretty. This is the Nana variety, and um, one of the passions of this client is uh, cut flower arrangements. Okay. And so I wanted to make sure when I was designing this garden that she had a bunch of options mm -hmm. that were a little bit more unique. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a great purpley blue. It really is. And it's, you just don't see it in every garden. Yeah, and it also comes in a white variety, okay. and there's also a little bit of a lighter blue color as well. Uh -huh. And, you know, you've got this traditional seed pod heads, the circular yeah. puffs. and So you could use it as a cut flower in every stage, really. Exactly. I mean, yeah. It's really, it's really pretty. How long does it bloom? Um, it blooms for most of the summer. Okay. Um, it started coming on a couple weeks ago here. Mm -hmm. um, it can handle the heat. It can handle... Um, a little bit of shade even, not a ton, mm -hmm. um, but it's a... It's really pretty. Yeah, it's one of my favorites for sure. So I notice you have a few different methods of staking throughout <laughs> the garden to keep everything, you know, upright and looking good. Um, so here, th these are those columbines that rebloom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I use three different support systems in this garden. Um, we use the peony hoops that have the grid pattern as well as the circular ones. Um, in the spring, we have a ton of peonies in here mm -hmm. that complement those lupin and the uh, alliums. And then for the columbines, um, to try to keep them looking a little bit more natural, I've used these fabulous metal stakes and gosh, I've had these for about 10 years. So it's been a great investment. Um, and so it's real simple because all that you have to do is press it in the ground and then it's got this little hoop that you can just set it in and that way it's out of your way and the mower's way and all that good stuff. And that makes sense for plants that have a single stalk um, mm -hmm. instead of like a big clump. Yeah, we use them on our hollyhocks as well. Uh -huh. um, they don't work quite as well on the delphiniums because the delphiniums, the flowers get real heavy. They're just and then too they, tall for that. Yeah, right. exactly. 
So, so uh, then here's another one with the daisies, another method. Yes, the daisies, the great floppers that they can be. <laughs> um, so we do a lot of cross staking. So we take pieces of bamboo and kind of you want to go in and think about a haircut uh -huh. and layering the haircut. So you want to go in a little bit further than you think that you need to. And then you can press it in and kind of give it a little fluff. And that way it gives it the support that it needs to actually stand upright as opposed to it, you know, crowding out the right. sedum that are underneath it. That makes sense. And, and you can put several going different directions exactly. in the same clump and keep it kind of looking more natural instead of if you were tying it up into a big bundle. Yeah. It, it just wouldn't look as natural. Yeah. You, yeah. you see sometimes people... Uh, using the tape, it kind of mm -hmm. looks like they're strangling the yeah. plants a yeah. little bit. I've tried that sometimes and <laughs> not been really happy with that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I yeah. found that, and I really enjoy staking. <laughs> it's kind of a science in itself, so you yeah. just kind of play around with it and what the plant needs and right. figure it out as it goes. So between staking and weeding and deadheading and pests and things, this garden goes all the way around the property, these uh, extensive borders. How much time would you say you spend um, maintaining it during the week? Um, during the week, we will spend about 24 to 32 hours mm -hmm. in this garden. During the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of depends on what it needs and mm -hmm. where we're at. Um, July is kind of a big maintenance month because yeah. we get everything coming on. And lots then, of deadheading. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of deadheading. And then because our season's so short, we'll start moving into doing... Um, We'll start cut down actually next month mm -hmm. with, um, you know, just starting with the daisies because unfortunately we have such a short growing season that they don't rebloom okay. like they do back east. Um, so we just keep moving along that way and Makes sense. making sure that the plants coming up are able to have the space to shine. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Not only are your borders amazing here, but the containers are so pretty too. Thanks. What's this, uh, what's this variety here? This is the Super Cal Petunia, and I am so impressed with how it's performed this year for a mounding effect. Nice. It stood up to uh, a week's worth of rain quite well. Oh, that's right. You've had a lot of rain here lately. We've had a lot of Straight rain, unusually. unusually. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And well, the, the color goes really well with the rest of the garden, too. Thanks. Yeah, I love it. Um, and funny story about these containers is uh, I store all the containers on the porch, and this spring when I was moving them down here, I caught something out of the corner of my eye, mm -hmm. and I thought it was an elk because yeah. we'll see them. Yeah. And it was running across the fairway here, and as I looked over, I realized it was a baby moose. Ah! A and moose. So, <laughs> a moose was on the loose. <laughs> and so I ran over to the neighbors and um, was able to see him drinking uh, out of the pond over uh, there. And it was just so cool. I'd never seen a moose on property before. That's pretty cool. Uh, not every gardener has that um, opportunity. <laughs> know, right? <laughs> pretty special. Look at all the bees on these hollyhocks. Oh, <laughs> so pretty. Yeah, they're great little pollinators, aren't they? Yeah, they're just just covered with uh, all kinds of uh, life. Yeah. yeah, I know the hummingbirds were out here earlier. They that were. Was, they're so fun to watch here. <laughs> Fighting it out for the yeah. <laughs> plant's attention. And, and then you have your hay racks. <laughs> oh, these are just, this is just gorgeous. Thank you. So it's two hay racks. It is. Each other, right? It's two 55 inch hay racks. It's a metal frame. Mm -hmm. um, and they um, have a cocoa fiber liner in them. Okay. So each hay rack has about 64 four inch containers planted in them. Okay. Um, with our short growing season, I have to kind of go for the instant gratification. So you so. start with four inch instead of little plugs. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And are and some planted in the front or everything on top or how does that work? They are, so I cut slits um, with uh, kitchen shears actually mm -hmm. to get through the cocoa fiber liner um, in each of the front rails and then um, wash the roots typically to make sure that I can get the plant in there without damaging the stem too much mm -hmm. and um, yeah and just keep working the pattern on down and oh they're so beautiful do you do you have to keep like what's the watering and feeding look like to keep them keep them looking like this all summer um, they actually hold a surprising amount of water um, so these ones I water 
every two days, every three days, kind of depending. It's nice because mm -hmm. they get the great morning sun and then the afternoon they're in a little bit more shade. So mm -hmm. they're not getting baked all day. That's helpful. And the pansies still look good and it's August. <laughs> <laughs> Colorado. That's right. One of the nice things about gardening in Colorado. Yeah. Um, well, I, I love this color scheme too. Do you change it up from year to year or this is, this is the pink kind of yeah, I try to change it up a little bit every year. Mm -hmm. um, I really, you know, typically I'll keep a couple plants the same, like the bubblegum petunias, and mm -hmm. um, I'm really liking the purple uh, lobularia in them um, this year. It is pretty. And then the pansies are the ocean matrix mix, so that matches what's along the borders as okay. well. Uh -huh. Nice, and these ivy geraniums are really fun. <laughs> Yeah, as well. they're nice. great. And then yeah. there's actually a fan flower in there too. Oh, oh yeah, working I see it its way there. in. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, it's a really beautiful combination. And thanks for showing us this gorgeous garden. This has been so fun to take this tour this morning and see mm -hmm. all of your great borders and great containers. Um, it's been really, it's just been really fun. Thanks, well, Tara. I love showing it off, <laughs> and thank you so much for coming out and taking a look at it. It's a good way to spend the morning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack from Garden Gate Magazine. I hope you enjoyed our video. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel and press the bell to get notified each time we upload a new video. You'll get content with useful gardening tips, design ideas, and how-to help for all levels of gardeners. I especially enjoy the garden tours and talks with fellow gardeners across the country. Be sure to follow us on all of our social platforms. You can see the list below. Thanks for watching.